Good morning, everybody, and welcome. This is a panel discussion convened by my office, the UN Human Rights Office, the Office of the High Commissioner, as well as with the uh, think tank um, Equal Rights Trust based in London. We have, um, my name is Claude Kahn. We have six panelists today. My, uh, I'm, I'll be moderating this discussion. I'm joined by uh, Farhat Ibrahim, who is sitting next to me in the room. Um, he is a OHCHR uh, Senior Minority Fellow, um, and uh, Ketevan Shubashvili, who is head of the Equality Department in the Georgian Ombuds Office, um, the Public Defender of Rights. Online, we have Jim Fitzgerald, who is the Executive Director of uh, Equal Rights Trust. We also have Regina Pajares Carillo, who is a OHCHR senior fellow based in Peru and working on intersectionality issues. She is also legal director of the, um, of the Office for the Defense of Right and Intersectionality of Peru. She works on issues in Chile and Peru. And we have Mumbi Ngugi, who is a judge of the Court of Appeal of Kenya. This uh, session concerns comprehensive anti-discrimination law. We are, we the organizers, which are ourselves in Equal Rights Trust, are, um, I, I can say, overjoyed to have arrived at this point. Um, you, are, you are here at the first pre-launch event of a guide on comprehensive anti-discrimination law that we have been working on with uh, Jim and his team at Equal Rights Trust since early 2020. Um, and I will just say a few words about that, and then I will hand over to Jim to tell you about that. Um, Jim and I met for the first time in person in Kyrgyzstan because we were both asked to come to Bishkek and to answer questions by the government of Kyrgyzstan as to why they should adopt a comprehensive anti-discrimination law. Um, the, in, in Kyrgyzstan, there's been a movement of civil society organizations um, that has been requesting this and has been pressing for it and doing advocacy toward the adoption of comprehensive anti-discrimination law. And my, my office uh, in, in the regional office for Central Asia in Bishkek had been supporting this and, and working toward um, trying to advance this legislation. And um, we were called to a, a meeting of parliamentarians and government officials um, to answer questions. This is, in, in, in our work, as well as I think really in the work of Equal Rights Trust, a very regular occurrence. We're called to explain the what's and the why's of this central right of the normative order and why and how it should be transposed into national law. The ban on discrimination is the only right set out in all of the nine core human rights treaties. Um, and governments are told regularly by their peers and by the supervisory bodies, such as the UN um, human rights mechanisms, the treaty bodies, that they should adopt comprehensive anti-discrimination anti law. And so we are regularly pulled into these discussions of um, the technicalities. What does it mean? How does it work? What should be set up? And how? Uh, and we endeavor to answer those. Um, and Bishkek was one stop on that, um, on that regular journey. And after doing our work for a day with the government, um, Jim and I went out to dinner and uh, we were discussing and it, it, uh, it turned out that both of us had been thinking along the same lines. We really need a guide. We need a, a, a document that, we that can be given to anyone be it government, civil society, national human rights institution, to explain why comprehensive anti-discrimination law. And uh, like two parents, we sort of said, let's put our families together. And we, uh, we, uh, we agreed to work together on, on a guide. Um, and the result is going to be published later this year. It's called Protecting Minority Rights, a Practical Guide on Developing Comprehensive Anti-Discrimination Law. Um, along the way, we have worked very intensively with 
the Equal Rights Trust team in meetings that have been effectively you know, several hours per week in walking through complex content, um, in walking through how, how to answer those questions in a way that is globally meaningful, taking into account the great diversity of legal systems around the world. Um, we also have not done that alone. We gave ourselves, asked, <laughs> asked of colleagues, senior colleagues, to join an advisory committee. And we have had an advisory committee of um, 10 or more very senior anti-discrimination law experts and equality law experts from around the world, from various different contexts, um, from various different countries, from very various different legal, legal traditions. Um, providing um, what I have to say is a, has been excellent um, shaping of our thinking. We have also had um, very strong engagement internally from my office across a broad range of desks. Um, one of the problems that we're addressing is that this sits across a broad range of desks. The, the grounds tend to get their own desk, and so some of the ways equality and anti-discrimination laws managed is in a, a fractured and non-holistic way. We've been trying to pull that together. Uh, and lastly, we've had great engagement by civil society and human rights defenders. We've done a total of four um, big consultations online in the COVID context on various thematics, um, including the core content of, of the laws and also on themes such as how do we understand the lines between some of the neighboring things like hate speech um, and anti-discrimination law or minority rights protection and anti-discrimination law. Um, so it has been very rich and I think we're on the cusp of producing a community-owned product that aims to take us one step further. Um, our panel today is organized as follows. Jim is going to tell you about the guide, what's in it. Um, not, <laughs> he's not going to read it to you, but he'll, he'll try to do a deeper explanation of why we do this and what's there. Um, and that's our first presentation. Next, we'll see a short film made by Equal Rights Trust on from, from uh, some of the perspectives uh, on equal, equality law worldwide. Then, um, rather than have a long series of panel introductions, we're going to field a few questions directly to the, each of the panelists, and they will give a five-minute um, answer of their perspectives on, on the question posed. And then we will open up for broader discussion. So that is the order of the day. Um, without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Jim Fitzgerald, who is ex Executive Director of Equal Rights Trust, to present our forthcoming guide. Jim. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Claude. Uh, thanks to uh, the World Justice Forum for, for hosting this event. Thanks to the panelists uh, for joining to give their valuable perspective. And thanks to our audience, both here in the room and, uh, and online. Um, so briefly, um, why did we why did we develop this guide? Well, I think you know Cla Claude's already given you the the specific context. You know, a meeting uh, of minds uh, uh, in in a, in a context where we were both being asked the same set of questions, and really, um, you know, our experience, my experience uh, at the Equal Rights Trust of of supporting and promoting the development of comprehensive anti discrimination laws over the last decade and more. Uh, has come up against the same questions, particularly from governments, time and time again. Uh, questions like, why should we adopt anti-discrimination legislation when we have the right to non-discrimination in our constitution? Why should we adopt comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation rather than laws dealing specifically with the rights of women, with the rights of persons with disabilities, with uh, problems of racial, ethnic, and religious discrimination. So why take a comprehensive rather than specific approach? And then thirdly, 
well, acknowledging that we, we should adopt comprehensive anti-discrimination law, and this is what the UN system has asked of us, how do we go about that? And what does, what does this, this legislation contain? And really, the guide aims to answer these questions. We, we aim to set out why a comprehensive approach, why a specific dedicated legislative approach is required and beneficial, and then to, to, to engage with what comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation uh, should contain if it is to be comprehensive, effective, and in line with international legal requirements. Now, when, when Claude and I conceived this project, we talked about a, an accessible, uh, user-friendly guide of, of less than 100 pages. Uh, when we completed the process of extensive research, legal analysis, consultation, and engagement, we have ended with a document which is nearly 350 pages uh, of, of detailed discussion and, and analysis of some complex legal concepts, which we've then tried to boil down and synthesize into a set of guiding principles, uh, core obligations and core components of anti-discrimination legislation. So I won't, I won't try and rehearse the content of the guide, but I want to try to address this question of why comprehensive anti-discrimination law and then what comprehensive anti-discrimination law as briefly and succinctly as I can. So why comprehensive anti-discrimination law? Uh, I mean, you know, I think it, it's clear to, to everyone, inequality impairs human dignity, causes and fuels, fosters poverty and underdevelopment, acts as a barrier to the enjoyment and, and realization of the sustainable development goals, limits the enjoyment of human rights. And really that's why uh, equality is a central feature of, of every of one of the, of the UN's key declarations from the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights through to the Sustainable Development Goals. You see this commitment to uh, creating an equal society and a recognition that that requires prohibition, prevention, elimination of discrimination. But why, why now since the, the 2000s, the early 2000s, has there been this growing consensus that that in turn requires dedicated and comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation? Well, our research, our analysis identified um, that really this is the result of evolving understandings of what it means to give effect to the commitment to ensure that all human beings are equal in dignity and rights. What, 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 what is required to make that, to realize that in practice? And really we, we found five uh, trends, five threads of evolving thought, which really leads you from that initial declarative statement through to a recognition and a consensus that what's needed is comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation. So the first is, in respect of the grounds of discrimination, what we call the personal scope of the right. If we look at the International Covenants and we look at the Universal Declaration, the, the, the formulation of the rights of non-discrimination was really around uh, five or six key grounds of discrimination, race, sex, religion, political opinion. Many of the grounds that we now recognize were um, omitted or excluded. And over the course of the last uh, five, six decades, the UN system has used uh, the other status provision in, in those two covenants to elaborate and recognize a much wider range of characteristics, including disability, age, sexual orientation, and gen gender identity. So we now have nearly 30 grounds of discrimination that are recognized that international law is requiring protection. And at the same time, there's been a recognition that the law need not only provide protection for those who have a particular characteristic, but those who are associated with people who have that characteristic, those who are believed or perceived to have that characteristic. And finally, a recognition that there is a need to protect from discrimination, which is intersectional, the interconnection between different characteristics. Secondly, there's been a growing recognition that uh, realizing equality requires not only equal treatment, what we call the prohibition of direct discrimination, being treated unequally because one has a particular characteristic, but also a recognition of other forms of discrimination, indirect discrimination, the recognition that individuals can experience discrimination as a result of the disproportionate impact of rules, policies, and procedures which are facially neutral. 
or the failure to make reasonable accommodation to, to enable, uh, to, to remove barriers which prevent equal participation. So there's been a, a move from a formal understanding of equality to a more inclusive enabling and, 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 and an approach to equality and discrimination, which is about the removal of barriers. Thirdly, there's been a, 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 an evolution in the understanding of remedy for discrimination, moving away from the idea of simply sanctioning those responsible and providing compensation for those uh, victimized towards an understanding that society needs to provide social and institutional remedies, remediation, restitution, and rehabilitation. And that there is a need for procedural safeguards, particularly around the treatment of evidence and proof, the transfer of the burden of proof from the perpetrator, for, from the uh, complainant to the respondent in order to make these rights effective in practice. Fourthly, there's been a growing use and an and understanding and legal codification of, of what it means to provide positive affirmative measures to, end, to accelerate progress towards equality. And then fifthly, there's been a growing understanding of what the law can and should do to combat the structural causes of inequality, stigma, prejudice, stereotype. And what what, what binds all of these five developments together is a clear, uh, is what it makes clear is that a, a constitutional prohibition on discrimination can never capture the complexity, the definitional and procedural uh, requirements that need to be codified into law and the specificity uh, which is required to make these rights uh, effective in practice. So there is there has been this this evolution towards a point in which there's a recognition of a need to codify into law definitions principles and concepts which can't be captured in a, in a single constitutional rights non discrimination and requires dedicated legislation and at the same time because of the growing understanding of the full range of protected characteristics which need to be protected and the ways in which those interact with each other and the different forms of discrimination there's a recognition that this can only really be achieved through a comprehensive approach. It's simply unfeasible to have specific instruments for each of the nearly 30 grounds of discrimination which need to be protected. And even if it were possible and practical, that would result in and does result in a lack of harmony in, in levels of protection between those grounds and a complete failure to address, to address intersectionality. So for that reason, we see you know, really starting from the early 2000s and, and, and at this point now in, in the early 2020s, a real complete consensus across the international system, across the UN system, the regional systems in Latin America, in the Americas, in Europe and in Africa of a need for a comprehensive uh, legislative approach to discrimination. So what then is comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation? Well, as I said, we, we've developed a, a nearly 300 page guide which delves into the, 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 the specific requirements. But in simple terms, comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation is law which has both the purpose and the effect of prohibiting all forms of discrimination and realizing equality for all. And we identify eight key features which we then elaborate on and define and codify in the guide. Comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation should prohibit all forms of discrimination on an extensive and open-ended list of grounds and in all areas of life. That's the first feature. Secondly, it should define all forms of discrimination in terms which match the definitions provided at international law. These forms of discrimination being direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, harassment, failure to make reasonable adjustment, segregation and others. Thirdly, comprehensive anti-discrimination law must permit, require, and provide for positive action, what's sometimes called affirmative action or specific measures or specialized measures. These should be both required and permitted, not seen as a form of discrimination, but recognized as a mandatory essential obligation. Fourthly, comprehensive anti-discrimination laws uh, should, should contain within them equality duties particularly on public decision makers to take into account how to eliminate discrimination and promote equality in the decision making process. Fifthly, comprehensive anti-discrimination laws must provide effective remedies. That means sanctions for those responsible, uh, restitution, reparation, compensation for those uh, victimized and remedies at the social and institutional level to recognize the social consequences of discrimination. 
Sixthly, comprehensive anti-discrimination laws must contain within them the necessary procedural safeguards to uh, correct the imbalance, the inevitable imbalance between claimants and respondents in discrimination complaints. This means the provision of legal aid. This means standing for um, uh, other stakeholders who can assist individual victims in what is an Im a power imbalanced uh, relationship and those provisions around the transfer of the burden of proof that I already mentioned. The seventh element for us is the requirement to establish an independent, dedicated and specialized equality body, the kind of body that Ketavan Shubashvili uh, works for and will, will tell us about. And, and then finally, comprehensive anti-discrimination laws contain within them measures to address the structural causes of inequality, stereotype, prejudice and stigma, not through prohibiting these things, but through countering them through a wide range of positive and proactive measures. So that then is why anti-discrimination law and what comprehensive anti-discrimination law is. And, and that really is the, the substance of this guide that we will be publishing uh, later this year. Thank you, Claude. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, what we would now like to do is to see a film by um, Equal Rights Trust uh, featuring voices of people who are engaged in challenging discrimination worldwide. Um, can we run the film? Equal Rights Trust, we fight inequality. Our mission is to support equality defenders, those using the law to secure an equal world. We cannot have an equal world unless we eliminate discrimination. And we cannot eliminate discrimination without comprehensive and effective equality laws. International law requires the adoption of anti-discrimination legislation. In the last two decades, a growing number of governments have recognised the value of such legislation, both by adopting it and calling on others to do the same. Dozens of countries, from South Africa to Mexico to Ukraine, have enacted comprehensive equality laws. These laws wouldn't exist without the collective action of equality defenders. Bosnia and Herzegovina started developing its equality legislation back in 2003. But it was in 2009 when the Comprehensive Equality Law was adopted in the form of the Law Prohibiting Discrimination. Following a draft produced by the civil society, the government formed an inclusive working group, which produced the text of the law which was mostly in line with best international and EU standards. Since then, the law pr proved to be an efficient instrument to challenge inequalities and discrimination in the society. It was used to address uh, discrimination in the private sector, such as employment and access to goods and services, but also to address structural discrimination, such as segregation in schools, failure to ensure inclusive education for children with disabilities, and failure to adopt state-funded parental leave allowance schemes. Most importantly, it was used for strategic litigation in forms of collective complaints, and the possibility to shift the burden of proof allowed litigants to challenge previously unchallengeable practices. But without a comprehensive equality law, progress to date would not have been possible. Luchar contra la discriminación es una tarea y obligación fundamental de todos los estados. Para ello es necesario que adopte medidas de diferente índole que permitan generar procesos de transformación profunda, social y cultural para que logremos erradicar las prácticas de discriminación y nunca más se le niegue el reconocimiento, goce o ejercicio de sus derechos a ninguna persona basados en su edad, sexo, religión, idioma, nacionalidad, orientación sexual, identidad de género, condición de refugiado, migrante o pertenencia a un grupo étnico. Por ninguna razón, a ninguna persona se le pueden negar los derechos humanos. En ese proceso es importante es reconocer el valor que cobra el contar con legislaciones adecuadas, que tengan un enfoque integral, que visibilicen las diferentes formas de discriminación, pero que también alienten acciones afirmativas para poblaciones históricamente discriminadas, que establezcan mecanismos adecuados para la denuncia y la sanción de estos hechos, sobre todo la restitución de los derechos afectados y la reparación integral para las víctimas, pero que también incluya una gama amplia de medidas de prevención, que genere mecanismos de coordinación entre el Estado y la sociedad civil, 
aliente e impulse la rendición de cuentas y garantice recursos públicos suficientes para implementar estas leyes, así como todas las políticas que deriven de las mismas. In countries that are yet to adopt anti-discrimination legislation, equality defenders are joining forces by forming coalitions to advocate for its development and adoption. CLPR is a non-profit based out of Bangalore, India, and we focus on litigation and research on the issues of gender, caste, disability. I'm here to talk a little bit about our bill. It's called the Equality Prohibition of Discrimination Bill 2021. And it seeks to prohibit discrimination on the basis of 24 protected characteristics like caste, religion, gender, among many others. India does not currently have a single civil law that addresses equality and discrimination. That's why we at CLPR drafted the Equality Bill to cover all these grounds and more. And it's been an interesting journey so far. Uh, we've had many uh, experts weigh in on the bill and it has gone through several rounds of consultation. We are now ready to take it to the political members of the society and that's where ERT has come in. A comprehensive approach to the implementation of the rights to equality and non-discrimination hasn't been any more important within the context of a global pandemic and consistently questionable administrative decisions that do not reflect international, regional, and domestic commitments to ensuring that no one is left behind within the context of service delivery, and that the last mile forward is ensured and safeguarded within the context of public health. The urgency and the need to ensure an intersectional approach can only be safeguarded by collaborative work within and beyond civil society that ensures that there is a comprehensive lens in consistently questioning who is left behind, who is not in the room, who's not at the table, where decisions are being made. This has highlighted that there is a need to ensure a comprehensive strategy, one that doesn't focus on silos or business as usual, but one that looks to the distinct and critical needs of those most left behind, those most vulnerable to violence and exclusion. Comprehensive equality laws are a necessary and powerful tool to challenge discrimination and ensure equality in different areas of life. They enable us to combat inequality in education, dismantle discriminatory practices in landlord and tenant relations, and challenge the discriminatory impacts of state responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Republic of Moldova became the first post-USSR country which adopted comprehensive equality legislation. This happened in 2012 when the parliament voted for a law on ensuring equality. And one year later, in 2014, uh, an Equality Council was set up. This is a new national human rights institution specialized in equality and non-discrimination. The data of the Equality Council evidence that women, persons with disabilities, elderly retired persons, linguistic and ethnic minorities are those who benefit with the equality legislation in Moldova, most of all. This is due to the adoption of the comprehensive equality legislation with open-ended list of grounds and setting up a strong equality council, a protection mechanism. We will be glad to share our experiences with other countries and contribute to the development of comprehensive equality legislation and setting strong equality bodies worldwide. At Equal Rights Trust, we support those using the law to create an equal world. We know that the fight for an equal world is a long one and a large one that will only ever be won through a long-term collaborative effort to address all of the different causes, economic, social, political, of inequality. But we also know that equality laws are an essential part of this puzzle and that those laws only come into being and they're only implemented and enforced through the activities of equality defenders. And that's why we dedicate ourselves to supporting them with the knowledge, expertise, networks and information that they need to do their work. It's also why the next step that we plan to take is so critical. 
As we look forward, we plan to establish a network, a meeting place for academics, activists and advocates working on equality law, somewhere that they can come together to uh, exchange information and resources, to share good practice and knowledge, ultimately uh, to collaborate, to work together to gather evidence, advocate for improved standards at the international level and then use those good practices to inform laws and policies uh, at the domestic level. At the Equal Rights Trust, we support those on the front line of the fight against discrimination by working in partnership to advance equality through law. The next step in our journey is to bring our partners together by creating a global network to unleash the potential of collective action. Rights Trust. <laughs> About to circle back around. Um, the next part of our panel uh, is an invitation to discuss the particular aspects of, of this area of law. Um, and we have four people uh, representing different places, professions, legal traditions, um, perspectives for that. We're going to start with Farkat. Uh, Ibrahim um, Farkad is Uyghur human rights defender, um, and he is uh, from Kyrgyzstan. So we start with him because he's from uh, where we where we first began this journey with Equal Rights Trust, um, and so we have asked him to address the question. Um, there is an active movement by civil society in, Kyrg in the Kyrgyz Republic to promote the adoption of comprehensive anti-discrimination law. Why has civil society taken this approach in your view? And do you think that the Kyrgyz Republic will adopt a comprehensive anti-discrimination law? And if not, why not? Farkat. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, distinguished guests, guests ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to say a couple of words about the current situation first. And uh, there are some certain uh, provisions in the Kyrgyz constitution related to uh, fight against discrimination, uh, but there is no comprehensive anti-discrimination uh, legislation in the Kyrgyz Republic due to numerous uh, reasons. And uh, very, uh, in many occasions, Kyrgyzstan was encouraged to, to adopt this anti-discrimination anti legislation uh, during the um, sessions of various organizations, including the UN and others. And, uh, Coming to your question, why civil society is so active? Because historically, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we uh, in, in in the Kyrgyz Republic we have quite strong civil society, and I would say that it is the strongest in Central Asia, and they have been always trying to achieve sustainable, positive impact, to um, uh, to oppose uh, legislation that are not democratic or and discriminatory and they are at the same time striving to promote people-centered legislation. Uh, and uh, also this anti-discrimination uh, legislation would be in favor of themselves. So I think this is uh, the main reasons why uh, the civil society is so proactive in this area. Uh, regarding the feasibility and possibility of adopting uh, this anti-discrimination legislation, I believe there is a political will of the current government to do so. Uh, the, the reason of these delays, the main reason, I mean, uh, is that uh, there are, uh, after the change of power in Kyrgyzstan uh, and with the new president, they have many other issues to deal with, including the, their priority and now is not with this particular issue. But even if uh, it is adopted, there is another issue, another problem is to how to implement and whether the government would be able to implement this new uh, good legislation. Uh, to, to, to exemplify this, I would like to say that we have brand new uh, criminal code with uh, humanized um, provisions, but the law enforcement authorities, the police, they still work uh, according to the old um, kind of habits according to the, in accordance to the old legislation. So it's, all, it's all also about implementation of this anti-discrimination law. But uh, I, I keep 
optimism, and I, I do believe and hope that this legislation will be approved. Thank you. Our experience shows that actually these things happen. Um, they take time, but and they take effort, but they do happen. Um, we're now going to turn to our, uh, yeah, our, our cyber space. We have a number of people online, um, including, as you can see, three of our speakers, but also people who are posing questions. And so uh, the next question is for Regina, uh, Regina Pajares Carillo, um, who, who is uh, with us today from Peru. She is uh, an OHCHR senior fellow, as well as legal director of ODRI, the Office for the Defense of Right and Intersectionality. Um, she works on issues in a number of countries, but in particular in Chile and Peru. Um, and we have a question that's being posed by, um, I'm checking the app, Benjamin Velsaco, who is international officer of the labor group Partido Mangag Mangagawa in the Philippines. And the question for Regina is, based on your own experience, how do you think the publication of the Practical Guide on Developing Comprehensive Anti-Discrimination Law will help activists working to combat discrimination? Over to you, Regina. Thank you, Claude. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, in my experience as a director of an NGO and as an activist in Chile, uh, I think there is um, this guide <laughs> could provide not only states and lawmakers and but also NGOs and human rights defenders, proper and complete information on the rights of equality and non-discrimination. It will help to create awareness and on how that right is constituted in international law and what are the proper standards and substantive elements on, on that right. Because even though political of bills and constitutions, like the Chilean constitution that is being discussed right now, the new possible new Chilean constitution, we can see that on parliaments, uh, also, the, they, the parliaments are, have always been guided by what each political party is looking for in the moment, and it will be a nice tool to have this guide for NGOs and human rights defenders to maybe try to push the discussions in the right way to, to actually help states uh, create a law that actually in, eliminate the gaps between human rights standards and what people from minority face on a daily basis. You know, the Chilean um, law of anti-discrimination was uh, issued after a terrible homophobic attack of Daniel Samudio. However, if you actually um, look at the law, uh, it actually is not uh, being, um, the standards are not being met and people with African descent cannot actually uh, use the, that legislation because the concept of non-discrimination has been reduced. There's also a uh, no burden, uh, changing burden of the proof. So a lot of people do not want to uh, denounce racial discrimination because this law does not meet these standards. So I think that with this guide, we can actually push with NGOs and human rights defenders, maybe this new project of uh, anti-discrimination law that is being uh, held by the Senate senators right now in Chile uh, to actually meet the human rights standards because this guide is quite uh, easy to read. It has complete information. It has also examples on how other states have been dealing with this, uh, with their obligations on these rights. So. I am really looking forward to be issued in Spanish because some human rights defenders actually uh, need to um, to read this guide soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regina. Um, our next question comes from the floor here in the room. Um, it is uh, from Meriwas. Meriwas is Senior Indigenous Fellow with us here as part of our UN Human Rights Office delegation. She's from Kenya, um, and she is di also Director of the Samburu Women's Fund. She has a question for our panelist, uh, is that right, M uh, Mumbi Nugugi, who uh, is both Judge of the Court of Appeal and uh, has been a member of the, the, the advisory panel to the guide. Meriwas. Good morning. 
Ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much, the panelists, for giving us the opportunity and bringing live uh, the discussion around issues on non-discrimination. Now, my question goes to uh, our beautiful judge from Kenya, uh, Mumbi Goge, uh, and this is regarding Kenya has a very strong constitution, protection for the right to non-discrimination and non-discrimination provisions in that areas of law as well. Now my question is, why do you think the state still needs comprehensive and discrimination legislation? Thank you. Right, thank you very much Jane, for that question. And good morning, everyone. Now, I think um, I want to address that question by looking at three things, where we are today, where we were before, and where I think we should be going with anti-discrimination legislation. Like the Jen says, we have very strong anti-discrimination provisions in our constitution. We have a specific article that everybody quotes, Article 27, which prohibits both direct and indirect discrimination either by the state or by any person on any of the prohibited grounds which are set out in the constitution. And the list in our constitution is open-ended and the, the term that is used in it is including, and then it enumerates certain grounds, including the, the phrase other status so that other grounds that are not listed in the constitution can be, are prohibited. But for us to get where we are today, we took a very long time. I think it took us over two decades to arrive at the 2010 constitution with these very progressive anti-discrimination provisions. Before that, we had the independence constitution and that constitution was very limited. One of the notable features of that constitution is that sex was not included as a prohibited ground. And it defined discrimination as affording different treatment to different persons attributable wholly or mainly to their respective descriptions. And it included race, tribe, place of origin or residence or other local connection, political opinion, color and creed. So as a result of that very limited description, sex was not included and differentiation was allowed on the basis of sex so that you could have legislation that directly discriminated against women in the area of personal law, in the area of succession, um, inheritance of property, ownership of property, which of course led to poverty and economic disempowerment of women. So when we got the 2010 constitution, I think we were all very excited, we were happy, we could now determine things in courts on the basis of these very wide lists. And under that same article, the state has an obligation now to take legislative and other measures, including affirmative action programs and policies to redress the anti-discrimination provisions. What I think is that because of these provisions, we have become a little complacent. About 10 years ago, when I and Jim, the Federation of Women Lawyers and other bodies were working on getting anti-discrimination legislation in Kenya, we were clear that we wanted a standalone legislation that would deal with the issues of non-discrimination in Kenya. Once we got this provision in the constitution, I think the feeling has been, well, now we are okay. We don't need anything anymore. But while the constitutional provisions have made a significant difference in advancing the right, I believe from all my experience in the last 10 years that it is still essential for us to have comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation. First, of course, the Kenya needs to meet its, its international obligation with regard to the protection of rights. However, while the constitution sets out the prohibited grounds, 
There is no definition, for instance, of what conduct is prohibited, what is the scope of the right, no provisions or situations in which this differentiation is permissible. So we need to have this legislation in order to provide for remedies. Today, the court is called upon to, to function a remedy because there's no legislation that tells us what we can do. We don't have a definition of what positive action needs to be taken by the state. Again, the court needs to, fun, to, to fashion that remedy, nor are there any safeguards provided in our law because we don't have such a law. The constitution can only set out the basic principles. It cannot go further and put in the things that Jim has so clearly pointed out in, in his summary of the guide. So we have enacted legislation in those 10 years. But if you look at that legislation that we have enacted, it makes a reference to Article 27 in the non-discriminatory provision, non-discrimination provisions, but it doesn't go any further and say, this is what is prohibited conduct. These are the remedies that you as a court can give. This is the remedy that you as a litigant who has been discriminated against can ask for. So that is for me, one of the major reasons why we need to have this legislation. We have done one or two of the things that uh, the guide talks about, one of which is the establishment of institutions to deal with questions of equality and protection of the rights of minority and have in mind the National Gender and Equality Commission, which was established by legislation about uh, eight or so years ago. But what that legislation does, it's just establish the, 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 the institution. It doesn't have any legislation, any provisions that cover the areas that are so well captured in the guide. So even as we have good constitutional provisions, there is an essential step in my view that is missing, that is fleshing out what those rights are, what conduct is prohibited, what remedies and so on. We still have in our books, legislation that directly discriminates, for instance, the penal code in relation to LGBTQ persons in the country, perhaps with clear legislative provisions, we can have a, a closer look at those areas of law that are still discriminatory and make, hopefully make a change in the enjoyment of rights and protection of minorities in our country. I think that's what I'd like to say about that for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mumbi. Um, yeah, the third person in the room in our fateful meeting in Kyrgyzstan was uh, Ketevan Shubashvili. She's head of equality department of the Office of the Public Defender of Georgia, um, in effect, the equality body of Georgia. Um, Jim and I did our work of presenting the international normative framework. You've heard the way we outline the norms. Um, by far the biggest interest in that discussion was for Ketty, and why? Because she comes from a place where they have adopted anti-discrimination law, comprehensive anti-discrimination law, and she works every day on implementing it. And um, the Kyrgyz authorities were fascinated with what she had to say. Um, how does it work? And so um, we have a, sen a question sent in in advance from Adnan Kadri Basic in Bosnia, which is straight down the line of this, this question. What have been the most significant impacts of adopting comprehensive anti-discrimination law in Georgia, in your opinion? Katie. Thank you, Claude. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm happy part to be part of World Justice Forum. Well, um, as for Georgia, uh, our constitution obviously ensures right to equality and several laws also recognize the notion of discrimination and equality. However, still in 2014, we adopted a comprehensive anti-discrimination law. Um, I would say that its premier advantage is that it's, uh, it has comprehensive nature and why it is important. 
Well, um, first I would say that the adoption of this legislation uh, started uh, wide public discussions about the notions of equality and discrimination. People got very much interested in what is it and what, what, how it is addressed to them. Um, the discussion is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, and even aggressive. However, there is still this, this discussion that, that is very important. And some duty bearers and social uh, groups started to perceive their relevant rights and duties stemmed from this legislation. Uh, next, I would say that uh, the comprehensive nature of this legislation enabled us um, to have a more um, uh, smooth communication and advocacy of this legislation because this law is one single document uh, comprising of just 12 articles uh, and it uh, gives responses to all of the questions that different parts of society have in Georgia. For example, it says that uh, the law, law uh, protects everyone because uh, the list of protected grounds is um, open ended uh, and uh, it covers all social groups or individuals who consider themselves to be victims of discrimination. It prohibits uh, discrimination of any kind committed in every section of life and it uh, proscribes everyone from committing discrimination like state agencies, public entities, natural persons, so e everyone. So those uh, answers laid in this legislation are very important because those uh, qu questions are, are asked very frequently from differ deeper, different parts of society. Uh, next, its um, adoption was really, uh, and co adoption I mean of comprehensive legislation was really important because uh, it's uh, it uh, reached uh, out the general public really effectively, rather it would have been in case of different lo laws recognizing uh, anti-discrimination regulations. Uh, different social groups and individuals got well informed of their rights and they started to fight against uh, discrimination. Uh, they started to uh, request uh, realization of their rights on equal basis from state agencies, private entities and etc. Because they uh, know better how whom to refer to as according to this legislation it is like uh, explicitly mentioned that uh, relevant legal remedies were designated uh, uh, courts of common jurisdiction and public defender of Georgia acting as equality body as, uh, as well. And um, obviously, uh, like uh, legislative uh, basis is a precondition for uh, exercising substantive equality in the future. And uh, the comprehensive uh, anti-discrimination um, legislation in our country, for example, serves as a um, uh, guideline for further steps as well. Uh, it kind of uh, served uh, and assisted in elaborating as uh, in uh, a, a strategy as to what. Should should we do in the in the future? Uh, so it enabled, for example, public defender of Georgia uh, first uh, at the initial stage to request uh, not uh, to commit discrimination. Uh, next, we ask to prevent discrimination, and finally, we ask to promote equality. Uh, obviously, uh, there are many uh, practical obstacles um, in our country that impede effective implementation of this comprehensive um, anti-discrimination legislation, and we have a, a long way forward and to undertake concrete um, awareness raising uh, activities uh, in order to properly implement this uh, law in practice. However, without this uh, comprehensive legal basis, it would be um, impossible I guess to like stand on this path and to get engaged in the process of achieving substantive and transformative equality in the country. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, yes, excellent. Um, we have come to the open floor side. I already see hands. I just want to briefly say also to those following online, there's an app um, which I believe you've been invited to download, and I'm looking at it. So if there are questions from the from people following remotely, please send them through that. 
Uh, I don't see any there, and we'll start in the room. I see Minority Rights Inter uh, Group International, and then another hand. Um, and if you just indicate to me, then I can also put you on the list. Go ahead. That, the microphone is over there indeed. Um, so if you're planning to take the floor, um, please go to the microphone. Hello everyone, so my name is Ashraf. I work for Minority Rights Group and I have a question to uh, Jim. Actually, I will focus on uh, LGBT rights within the framework of uh, adopting a comprehensive uh, anti-discrimination law. So we've seen that in the case of uh, Ukraine, for instance, uh, the adoption of such a law was uh, strongly influenced by the EU and um, it was rewarded by the visa liberalization uh, with Ukrainian nationals. So uh, from a perspective of like external relations, it didn't really uh, bring uh, a great change in the lives of LGBT community in uh, Ukraine, uh, in the sense of some studies even argue that uh, bringing up the debate in Ukraine even made uh, homophobic attacks even greater against LGBT activists in the country. So um, my question is how uh, to make sure that the adoption of a comprehensive law brings also the much needed societal uh, change, uh, whether it's through uh, raising awareness or uh, training public servants, but like how to make sure that the uh, comprehensive law not only brings the legal change, but also brings uh, an actual societal change in the mentality. Thank you. Um, yes, why don't we take a couple of questions and then, well, that was a targeted question to Jim. Let, why don't we allow Jim to respond? Um, Jim, do you want to respond? Sure, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, that, that's a really excellent um, question. Uh, I think, and, and, and there are a number of parts to the, to the answer, I guess. I think the first thing to acknowledge is that um, it is important that movements to enact uh, any anti-discrimination legislation, uh, including comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation, are meaningfully driven by and led by um, civil society and government within the, within the country. And there are, you know, Ukraine is, is one of a number of examples of countries in the European space where the movement towards the adoption of comprehensive anti-discrimination law has been um, catalyzed by uh, attempts to integrate with or, or, or associate more closely with the European Union. And I think in general, that has been a force for good. Uh, you know, the, the, I think uh, Katie would attest that, that in Georgia, I know that in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where one of our questioners came from, you know, the, the influence of the EU was critical in, in moving governments to prioritize this and get this law on the books. And then once enacted, it has been, uh, it has been you know, effective in addressing a, a range of uh, patterns of discrimination as we've heard, but uh, the, the negative effect, the potential negative effect if it, is if the law is seen as an imposition, as something which is imported from outside or, or forced upon the country from outside uh, a, a, as a means to secure some other benefit. And I think we definitely saw that in Ukraine, I think probably more so than in, than in the other European countries where the same, the same process, the same integration uh, imperative has been there. I think it's been more pronounced in Ukraine and I think that was unhelpful, decidedly unhelpful in actually ensuring that the law was, uh, has been as effective as it, as it should be. The, the Ukrainian government very much portrayed itself as doing this uh, because it was being forced to rather than because it chose to. And indeed, they, they, the, the government had to pass two laws, uh, one to, to revise the second one only two, two years after it was first adopted because the, the, there were gaps and inconsistencies within it because it hadn't been well drafted. And again, I think as, as a consequence of that um, sense that it was being imposed. Turning to what the law can do to ensure that um, you know, the, the law provides a platform for actually addressing patterns of social stigma, violence, um, particularly against the most marginalized LGBT community is obviously in many countries the most marginalized, but, but there are also other, other communities, religious and ethnic minority communities, for example, or uh, specific uh, subgroups in, in, in different countries. 
I think there are a couple of things. So the first is that the law needs to be actively uh, and impartially enforced. And that, that, that means people like Mumbi and people like Keti using uh, the institutions of the court and, and the independent equality bodies to really uh, enforce, take enforcement action uh, and, and to interpret the law in line with international standards as prohibiting discrimination across all of these grounds um, there is a deterrent effect which results from litigation, which is successful, uh, from the award of remedies, from uh, requirements of public apology and so on. There is a clear deterrent effect, um, both on the individual uh, di discriminating bodies, but more so societally. And I think that takes us to the second step, which is that ind independent equality bodies, government has to really provide clear guidance to duty bearers, private businesses, government entities, service providers, and so on, on how to understand, interpret, and apply their obligations. And that, that is inherently connected with that enforcement action. So what, 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 what a business needs to see is, uh, is that, you know, there are examples of people bringing case, cases of discrimination and winning them, an enforcement action being taken, and then being provided with the, the guidance on how to ensure that, that they do not uh, repeat those those patterns and and experience uh, adverse judgment against them. And then I think thirdly, and and this is an area in which much more work needs to be done. And I think is is an area of priority for us as we look forward. There is clearly in international law a positive obligation on states to proactively counter stereotype, prejudice, and stigma through the educational system through measures of increasing participation and inclusion in public bodies and, and, and public spaces, through public awareness raising, through uh, campaigns and so on. And this is a, it's a clear obligation. It's written into the text of the CERD. It's written into the text of the CRPD. It is, it is, is clearly um, uh, an element of the, of the right obligation that's in, in both of the international covenants. And yet it's something that states don't really do or don't do systematically and don't do well. And so that I think is, is, is the key thing. So uh, enforcement action, uh, which is clear and definitive about the fact that, that the discriminating on all these grounds is unlawful, direct statutory guidance to duty bearers on how to ensure that they act in a lawful way that they do not perpetuate discrimination. And then thirdly, proactive systematic measures uh, by the state to use the educational system and, and other means of awareness raising to counter stigma, prejudice and, and stereotype. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I would ask you to introduce yourself because I don't know you. Of course, like I'm always a little nervous when I'm next to the microphone. But I am Angela Suarez. I am founder of Lexbox.com. We are creating technology for providing legal services for vulnerable groups in Latin America. And I come for, from Colombia, that is a very conservative country. All the recent advances for, min, for, for, minorit, for minorities, such as the right to abortion and gay marriage, has been made through constitutional actions and have been granted by constitutional court. There is no political will for this kind of comprehens comprehensive regulation. The Congress is still very conservative and does not represent minorities. We don't have majorities in Congress in order to, pa to pass this kind of regulation. But there are, there are still very urgent issues that need to be prohibited as soon as possible, such as conversion treatments that include practices of torture. And um, I want, I want uh, to understand this tension because, of course, it would be easier to pass this kind of urgent regulations instead of, a, let's say, debating the comprehensive regulation in Congress. Of course, I understand all the benefits of the comprehensive regulations, but for some societies, it is not possible in the point that we are now. And so how could we do this? And the other thing is that we... Uh, just have elections in Colombia last um, weekend, and the second round are between two different uh, candidates. One of them is really uh, progressive and is, is uh, in favor of different minorities, uh, such as racial, cultural, uh, 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 they have very strong uh, gender uh, policy, uh, po uh, sorry, <laughs> um, 
uh, yeah, public policy. But there is another that is to like totally the contrary. He's denying all the uh, systemic violence against vulnerable groups, and he denies also a every special public policy that is necessary in order to achieve real uh, equality, not only equality in the paper that we already have in our constitution. So uh, I would like to hear how you guys can assess this kind of tension we have between comprehensive regulation and urgent regulation that could actually pass through Congress. Thank you very much. I think in our first two interventions, we're really already going straight to the issues. It's, it's a great discussion. Um, I would now allow uh, several interventions and then ask the panel to come back so it doesn't turn into a dialogue between one or, one or more things. So I would give you the floor um, to please introduce yourself and speak into the microphone. Again, I invite anybody online to send questions over the chat. I don't see any at the moment. I hope I'm using the chat properly. Okay. Uh, Good. Yes. Hi, my name is Michaela Bryan Mills. I'm a graduate from the University of Oxford and Stanford University, where I studied under Bill Newcomb, CEO of the World Justice Project. Just to keep it brief, my question is, what role, if any, do you think that artwork has to play in changing the mentalities of society toward equality promotion? That's my question. And the background to the question is that I recently completed field work in Tunisia where there is vibrant legal provisions about protecting women's equality. However, it's not translated into practice. So what civil society associations and other activists are doing is using artwork to try to change the mentality of society that women matter. Thank you very much. We have one more question from the floor. I'm now worried that I'm not seeing questions that are being sent in online, so I've given my phone to one of the organizers. But while we wait to see, have my phone cleared up, um, why don't I invite, again, Minority Rights Group. Super, thank you very much. Ah, good, there are some there, okay. Thank you to all the panelists for your really interesting inputs. Uh, it's really exciting to hear about this project and I really look forward to reading the guidance. My name is Lauren Avery. I am Intersectional Disability Project Officer at Minority Rights Group International. Uh, I was really interested in what Regina had to say about intersectional discrimination and also uh, her video in the, the previous panel, which we also attended. Um, so it was really fantastic to hear, hear you speak, Regina. And this question is for you. It actually follows on from the previous question about the role of art, um, so it perhaps links to that. But I know that we have come a very long way in, in developing our understandings on intersectional discrimination and the guidance on comprehensive uh, anti-discrimination legislation that you are talking about today is, is a real symbol of, of the progress that we've made. However, I know that there's a really long way to go still in understanding how intersectional discrimination presents itself in the context that we work, uh, especially for minorities, people who are the minority <laughs> group within minorities. Um, and so my question to you is how do we ensure, it, who, how do we ensure that society's understandings of intersectional discrimination are sufficiently developed to ensure that this legislation, if, it is, if and when it is hopefully adopted, would be effectively implemented and ensure real change on the ground because um, as the previous uh, person uh, who asked the question pointed out that we can have this legislation in place but it doesn't always ensure um, that it, it sees real change on the ground. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, we have one targeted question and two questions to I think the panel. I have one now on, on the chat, which is Mabel from Uganda would like to ask Jim, is it important to replace the word equality with inclusive in our anti-discrimination policies to ensure inclusivity? Is a question from Mabel from Uganda. Um, I suggest we proceed as follows. Uh, Regina, why don't I ask you to respond to the particular question and then I'll go around the panel 
to respond to the general the questions, and then I'll come to Jim. Regina. Okay, I'll try. I'll try to do it with my best English uh, possible. Uh, in Latin America, especially in countries like Chile and Peru, if legislation does not mention the specific grounds of of discrimination, if the wording is not correct, judges often do not take in, uh, intersectional discrimination into account. That's why I think this guide is important because it can use. It can be used for activists, for human rights defenders, for lawyers, for um, lawmakers to actually press, press uh, not only on individual cases, but on, on macro levels. I don't think that it will solve the problem, but it's an important tool to start advocating for, uh, for an equal, <laughs> I, I don't know how to say it in English properly, but uh, for uh, for um, an equal, um, can I use my Spanish in this? Um, sí, por favor. <laughs> um, eh, espero ser traducida. Voy a tratar de hablar de forma lenta. Eh, en todo caso, eh, entiendo que para eliminar las brechas se requiere un trabajo conjunto. No solamente instrumentos como esta guía, la legislación adecuada, sino que por el momento, así como están las cosas en la sociedad, sobre todo en sociedades que están en crisis como Chile en este momento, o Perú, que también tiene crisis políticas constantes, eh, los derechos de las minorías siempre van a estar en juego y siempre vamos a tener que estar desde el activismo y desde todos los espacios posibles eh, luchando para que se cumplan eh, eh, para que se cumplan y para que se puedan visibilizar. No creo que... que se resuelve en el corto plazo, pero sí encuentro que como instrumento de lucha esta guía es muy, muy importante. Creo, espero que eso resuelva la pregunta. Eh, si no, no, hay, no tengo problemas en seguir conversando eh, eh, y voy a tratar de, eh, de, de decirlo en inglés la próxima vez mejor. Eh, eh, y espero que se haya entendido eso. Y si no resuelve, no hay problema. Puedo, puedo seguir conversando de repente... Eh, in other spaces. Hasta, eh, muchas gracias. Super. Thank you. And we're very grateful we have a volunteer translation in the room. I will try. Like, I will do my best too. Super. But as I understood, like in, in general in Latin America and mostly in countries like Peru and Colombia, we have also different political a crisis and different political situations. So we shouldn't we shouldn't be depending on the political will in order to actually enforce uh, the, these human rights of minorities. And um, and Regina thinks that this guide is actually a tool for activists and for for people enforcing this kind of rights uh, to to actually keep the agenda going. And also, I heard also something that I really agree with, that is normally uh, judges in, in Colombia, at least, and generally in Latin America, they are so conservative. So normally, if there's a, a regulation talking about discrimination, they will not take it as, a, let's say, a intersectional. Or they will, they will not use this as, a, a, as for protecting LGBT communities or women, etc then uh, this guide will also be very helpful in order to uh, say judges like, look, this is how you should be interpreting the laws that are already there. So I, I, I hope like it matched what, with what you said. Thank you very much. Um, so we have pending questions also on the question of what to do when there's an absence of political will, also on the role of artists, and we have targeted questions. Um, would anyone like to jump forward from our panelists, Ketty. Um, well, from abs uh, about absence of political will, this is really familiar for us because in Georgia there was no political will actually. What happened in 2014 was that it was one of the obligations stemming from the um, uh, uh, fr from the agenda between European Union and jo Georgia that. Uh, anti-discrimination legislation should be at place. And um, our government kind of exchanged uh, this uh, uh, one of the uh, things uh, to visa liberate, uh, liber uh, visa free regime with European Union that 
we have since 2017. So it was one of the big benefits. Uh, uh, actually, what, uh, what happened was that uh, some conservative forces re uh, were really against uh, of adoption of this legislation, and um, it uh, has never been a smooth process. Like adoption of this legislation, uh, drafting law, and then implementation was a really hard process in our country. And um, you might have a question, what happens when you have no benefit? benefits on the other side and how can, can you persuade your governments to do this? Well, I think and what we also did after adoption of this legislation in order to be um, effectively apply, applied in practice, we tried to persuade all stakeholders and basically duty bearers that it is also beneficial for them and to persuade general public that it is not only a aimed to, for example, some minorities or social groups, but rather it covers covers literal, literally everyone. For example, in our country, in labor relations, there is a, a big problem about uh, like restriction of labor uh, rights on the ground of political or different opinions. So these type of uh, examples also enabled us to illustrate that it cover, covers literally everyone. So one day, uh, all of us, maybe not belonging to one of the minority groups, may also be subjected to discrimination. And also, along with this process, for example, in Georgia, it, uh, for some duty bearers, not all obviously, who basically care about their reputation, it became shameful to be um, named as, uh, uh, as uh, someone who committed discrimination, who be, to be named as perpetrator of discrimination. Um, as we um, very effectively apply the mechanism of name and shame, because it usually works. And um, basically public um, agencies and uh, big private, uh, private entities, again, ca caring about their image and reputation, try to avoid discrimination and may not sincerely, but um, in uh, response to the to this threat, they kind of try to uh, obey to equality principles and do something, you know, like either elaborate internal anti-discrimination rules to inform about uh, equality rights, um, their um, staff mates and so on, or um, like um, undertake several activities in order to be in compliance with anti-discrimination legislation and, and that they at least they have something to say that they have done this and this. And uh, as uh, examples, they, they, uh, it uh, works as a chain and uh, it has uh, some uh, positive imp impacts on, on general situation as well. Thank you very much. Uh, role of artists, anybody want to field that one? Mumbi, Farhat, Regina? Um. Jim wants to take that one. Okay, you have a targeted question also. So uh, I call on Jim to answer both the particular question from Uganda on the terminology equality and also role of artists. Yeah, so I, well, I, I'm going to try and uh, address the, the question both about the role of artists and um, the, the, the really compelling point that was made by the colleague in the room about you know, how, how to prioritize between using existing constitutional rights through litigation action to overturn discriminatory laws and policies uh, and challenge them, uh, how to balance that against, you know, pushing for um, the adoption of uh, new legislation where there is a, an absence of political will. Um, I, I think these are all, to, from my perspective, in terms of how we approach this at the Equal Rights Trust, the answer is, is broadly the same. The adoption of comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation is a necessary but not sufficient condition for an equal society. So the, the, what this guide sets out very, very clearly, I hope, and reinforces and, and really builds on a couple of decades of advocacy across the UN system, which now really has built this consensus. State cannot, meet their international human rights law obligations and their commitments freely entered into under the SDGs and, and others to eliminate discrimination and promote equality of participation in the absence of comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation. It is that simple. It must be adopted. It is a, a legal requirement at, at international human rights law. 
it is a functional necessity when we look at sustainable development, the creation of equal, just, uh, and democratic societies. So, so it's necessary, it's unavoidable, it's required, it's obligatory, but it's not the only thing uh, that, that is needed. And um, absolutely, there is, there is huge work to do in every society which has adopted comprehensive anti-discrimination law um, to sensitize and raise awareness amongst rights holders and duty bearers as to what the right to equality and non-discrimination means, what it looks like, what it, what it, what, what, what's the substance of it, the tangible nature of it, what the grounds are, what, what different forms of discrimination are. And any and all measures should be used to raise awareness, uh, sensitize and inform the public duty bearers and rights holders uh, about the contents of the rights. That means uh, art and, and, and everything else. At the same time, um, overturning discriminatory laws and policies is an immediate obligation on states. States have an obligation to refrain from discrimination and, and that takes its, you know, it is at its most um, uh, urgent where we look at legislation which is directly discriminatory or, or policies which are, are directly discriminatory. And so there is no, uh, no, we would never say that civil society actors should not prioritize litigation action uh, and other forms of challenge to discriminatory legislation over the adoption of comprehensive anti-discrimination law. Uh, those are strategic tactical questions which are based on, on contextual factors and it really is for civil society actors to work out what your priorities are. But our message coming out of this guide is that state actors must enact this legislation. It is an obligation, it is an immediate obligation. That's not to say they shouldn't do everything else as well, but they must do this. Um, and so, yeah, so, so for me, this is all part of the same thing. Comprehensive anti-discrimination laws as a necessary component, an essential component, in our view, a really central component, but by no means the only thing that must be done either by states or by, or by civil society actors. Briefly on the question about inclusion versus equality, I have a bit of a bugbear about this. Uh, you know, to me, uh, equality is is the concept, is the word, is the right, is the thing that we work towards. We want an equal society, a place in which all persons, irrespective of status, identity, social position, belief, can participate, have the, have equal capability to realise their own choices, to to participate on an equal basis with others. That that is the society that we we should aim towards. That is the, the, the concept which has its grounding both in the UDHR and, and all the way through to the Sustainable Development Goals. Equality is the thing to which we aim. Uh, inclusion is, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is an element of equality or a way of, a way of examining equality. And I think the, the Convention, the, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability has hit the right note here. In their general comment uh, on the rights to non-discrimination and equality, uh, I think from 2019, they talked about the convention, the CRPD, embodying an inclusive model of equality. And I think that is how we, how we take these two terms together. We talk about a model in which uh, all are meaningfully included. That has a, a remedi that has a preventive and remedial element. That has an enabling and participatory element. It has a, uh, a, a, an element around the removal of barriers and, and accommodation. Um, and uh, and so that is is I think the way to, to sort of fit these two concepts together. But please let's not lose the word equality. That that is ultimately uh, what we seek: an equal world, uh, a world in which all can participate equally and pursue their own choices uh, with equal capability. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Um, would anyone like from the panelists like to field any of the outstanding issues that were that were on? Go right ahead. Thank you. I totally agree with other panelists, and um, uh, I would like to to add that art could be the very instrumental in promoting the importance of uh, the anti-discrimination legislation, because uh, people everywhere uh, in the any part of the globe they perceive like visual images in a more like comprehensive way, and uh, when we increase the visibility by exhibitions, for instance, or film festivals, it, uh, it could also um, contribute to the promotion of the importance of this, uh, of this issue. 
And uh, in terms of political will, I believe that if there is none, we have to create one uh, by using different uh, approaches, techniques, and uh, with the involvement of different stakeholders, and by using uh, so-called uh, stick and carrot uh, strategy. For instance, if you, uh, I, I, I would like to put it in a very simple way. For instance, we can say to the government, if you approve, if you adopt this legislation, we will give you in return something beneficial for you. For less, uh, just like the visa liberalization, for instance, uh, regime or uh, additional grant or loan or as simple as that. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Regina, yes? Yeah. Yeah, regarding art, I think, yes, it is an important uh, tool to express uh, human rights violations. It has been done so uh, by indigenous peoples across the world and people with African descent and to point out uh, the, the different struggles in their access to human rights. It's a good way to, to express uh, inequalities. And regarding uh, what uh, the other the other question, I think yes, like Farkat said, there are different approaches, and we have to try to take them all if we can. And, and there is also the obligation, as Jean mentions, and and the guide actually makes it quite visible and and gives you easy tools to to advocate. So I think it will be. An, I really, I'm really hoping it will be trans translated into Spanish soon. But yes, when there's no political will, we have to try all the approaches needed, you know, and there's no like one single solution. So that's it. Great, thank you. Yes, it will appear in all of the UN languages and uh, we are planning to try to do an accessible uh, uh, language version subsequently. Mumbi, I saw you. Uh, Switch on your microphone. She's working with the tech. Oh, no, she's we can't hear you. Are you? I think you need to yeah, unmute. I'm, I'm, there you are. Okay. To unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Very good. Yes, I think I think you can hear me now. So I wanted to comment on two things about art, and I think there was a question from Colombia on what to do in circumstances where you have a very conservative society and I think also conservative political environment has no will to bring in anti-discrimination anti -discri provisions. With regard to that, I think one of the things that uh, we've done a lot in the past in Kenya, in civil society, is to use art, whether in the form of uh, drama or music, or cartoons to educate people within the community about the need for equality and non-discrimination, especially in relation to women, persons with disabilities. There is an area, of course, that, that the society is still very conservative. That is where minorities like uh, sexual and gender minorities are concerned. That would still be a problematic area. But I think at in all its different manifestations is essential for edu public education, changing perceptions, uh, trying to combat stereotypes in society. With regard to conservative so social uh, societies, if you look at our history, you note that it wasn't until 1997 that we change the constitutional provision that directly discriminated against women, that omitted sex as a ground of discrimination in the constitution. Since then, and since the 2010 constitution, which gives us a major advantage in combating discrimination, we still have had to go back to the communities and say, look, your culture says A, B, C, D, that women are not equal, that this is the case, but now the constitution says this. So in that, to, to that extent, the constitution has given us a major disadvantage, uh, sorry, a major advantage, so that even in the absence of comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation, we are still able to go to the communities and tell them this is still prohibited. What the guide would do and what 
comprehensive legislation would do is to now really flesh out the type of conduct that is uh, prohibited by law, that uh, the, the kind of manifestations of discrimination that we need to get rid of. And when we do that, when we talk to communities, elders, and we tell them, look, this type of conduct is not permissible under our law, under our constitution, then you may eventually, gradually begin to make some changes. And I've seen that in certain areas where we have worked as where I've worked as a judge, and in the type of cases that can be forming, in that uh, people are now beginning to recognize, yes, we had these laws, we have this culture that, that permitted this kind of conduct, but now the constitution, the law says you cannot do this anymore. We've also been able to change a lot of the discriminatory provisions in legislation, for instance, in terms of the uh, parental responsibility for children and so on because of the kind of litigation that has come before the courts. One challenge would be where you have conservative judicial officers, and I think that has been mentioned by one of the participants, uh, one, of the one of the questioners talked about conservative judicial officers. And when that happens, we the process of appeals does help a lot to change some of the jurisprudence that are emerges that is a, that, that, that is inimical to achieving equality in our society. So education through art, litigation, and the kind of legislation that we may hopefully pass may help to achieve uh, some measure of equality in, 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 in society. But I think for us in Kenya, the challenge is to get civil society working again towards pushing government towards uh, enacting anti-discrimination, comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation, both as part of its international obligation, but also as, an, as necessary to fully achieve the promise of Article 27 of our constitution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mumbi. Um, we are running against time. I, I just take a couple more minutes. Um, I have one, one question on the chat that I'll just answer myself, which is how extensively does the proposed anti-discrimination document, the guide, clarify normative standards for states in recognizing, that the, in recognizing groups that need to be protected, in particular groups that do not fit an immediately perceivable characteristic such as language and nationality, which can be hard to define in some circumstances, asks Matthew Grant, master's student at Utrecht. We do dedicate um, a chapter of the guide to this question, to the recognition of groups, to the naming of groups. Um, it was not a simple chapter to write. Um, and it, to some extent, cuts a little bit against the grain of the, the law that we're aiming at. But it's sufficiently important that we have addressed it. So we invite everyone to look at the guide and on, on the question of minorities and, and naming groups and how, how we've tried to to treat that question. I think um, if people have 30 second, from the panel, 30 second concluding words, I invite. Um, otherwise, does anyone have anything final to say from, from, our, from our excellent panel? Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, all of the panelists for joining us today. It's been, uh, you know, it's been really fantastic to have this diverse range of experiences, people working with the law in different ways, advocating for law reform, uh, applying the law through the courts, implementing the law uh, from uh, the perspective of the national uh, human rights institutions. Um, so thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to Claude and um, for, for, for the audience, um, you know, as, as Claude said, this is the, the first step in us beginning to uh, raise awareness about the forthcoming guide, which we expect to publish later this year. So please uh, follow the Equal Rights Trust, follow UNOHCHR for further information. And, uh, you know, we, we look forward to engaging with all of you on the guide as it, uh, as it is published. Thanks, Claude. Thank you, Jim. And as a final word, I'll field the art question. I just want to say, of course, we need the artists. We need the artists to point the way to, ch to social change that can enable societies to move toward the need for these things. Yesterday um, at the Hague Talks, um, we were with Meriwas and colleagues, 
Um, and we heard a, you know, a powerful presentation on a, an artist who was working on femicide in, in Mexico um, and galvanized you know, a movement of people um, based on her work. That's how we get the social energy to carry forward legislation of this kind. So of course, bring on the social art. Um, that that is something very important for these for these for 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 us moving forward. Our, these laws play a positive role, but there are many roles to be played by by various different actors. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful discussion. Um, it was a perfect panel, and uh, yeah, wishing you a nice afternoon and looking forward. Please do be in contact with us. You can find our contacts online, and uh, we welcome any any uh, any questions or communications. We're looking to publish in September, Knockwood. Have a nice day.